and the topic is cognitive considerations for decision makers. Um, in case you haven't met me, I'm, I'm Dr. Chris Bro. I'm a faculty member at Old Dominion University. Um, my background is um, human factor psychology. Uh, I've been working in the field for approximately 16 years. Um, we also have panelists, um, uh, Mr. Jay uh, Gedrin, who's an associate data scientist for Booz Allen Hamilton, and uh, Missy uh, Schoenbaum, who you just met, who's a biological scientist for the USDA. So the purpose of this panel is to discuss us, uh, humans as decision makers, uh, and as humans, as decision makers, we have a limited cognitive capacity. Uh, given our limited capacity, we take shortcuts that can aid with decision making. But heuristics don't always uh, lead to the best decisions. Human decision making can be prone to biases uh, that can potentially degrade our overall decision making ability. Therefore, it's to our benefit to be aware of some of our cognitive limitations. Um, if we are aware of our cognitive limitations and biases, this can help us become more effective decision makers. So, first, it may be helpful to discuss what I mean by cognition. And for the purposes of our discussion, we're considering cognition to be thinking. Um, we are human information processors. So, we're conceptualizing this process in uh, a fairly coarse manner, dividing it into three overall processes. Attention, which we're conceptualizing as the, the energetics of cognition that allow us to take in information for further processing. Working memory. Working memory is a form of short-term memory um, where it's essentially what you're actively thinking about. So the information you're actively manipulating uh, inside your, your mind. And the third component is long-term memory. Long-term memory is a relatively permanent form of memory, um, a relatively stable, and it's essentially um, you know, things that you have committed to memory and can recall with varying degrees of success. So first I'd like to uh, turn our focus on attention, um, and I want to toss it to Jay. Jay, do you have any general thoughts on attention? That I do. Raise your hand when you've heard the name of this book or publication. Okay? Meatball Sunday. How about Purple Cow? Harvard Business Review. Edward Tufte. Okay. All right. Attention. You know, so I was in the military, and it's funny. We go to school, and we get taught you're supposed to have an attention step. And the thing is, we heard from Congressman Forbes. Does anybody know the magic number he threw out there? It astonished me, actually. People come to me, he says, and ask me, I want to get in front of a politico. I need to talk to him or her. How do I do it? And his, what was his grain of advice? 11 seconds. 11 seconds. 11 seconds. I was... Very surprising to me. It got my attention. Okay, I got up. I did something strange. You had a feeling, perhaps, like maybe he's out of here. Or did they open the cocktail bar already? <laughs> Nonetheless, you had something that caught your attention, and you got 11 seconds, perhaps. Now, that's a, a, a man who works in the space of attention. And <clears throat> the titles I rattled off I wanted to share with you because we can learn a lot, not from the schoolhouses I went to, where they ask you to do an antic like I just did. Now, good luck with that in front of your board of directors. They'll think it's funny for less than 11 seconds, and then the remainder of that time, you'll be out the door. And I was always frustrated with this thought, you're supposed to give an attention step. And it's okay in a, uh, a conversation like this, but the world of marketing is about attention. Yes or yes? I already got two yeses up here. So 
the whole domain of marketing is getting your attention. And I would just like to throw out there that you can learn a lot, and I want to share with you just a couple of tips, from the marketing field. And what I rattled off, we're going to get to Edward Tufty later, but I just wanted to do that in one segment. Purple Cow and Meatball Sunday are both books written by Seth Godin, G-O-D-I-N, and he is considered amongst the pioneers and fathers of modern day marketing, inbound marketing, etc. Another one would be, um, um, uh, oh, I'll think of it. This is long term memory. This is long term memory. That's a demonstration, <laughs> and we'll get to that. So the idea he asks, Seth Godin says, who here, and I'll ask you the question, who here has ever seen someone stop on the side of the road on I-64 or some other highway, stop, get out of the car, and take a picture of a cow? What if it was a purple cow? Mom's pulling over. Get the kids in front of the purple cow. No, on the side. We want to see the whole. He says you need to be different. So let me just wrap up by saying you can use some small tricks that are available for you for free, and I would just offer the idea of color because color has an emotional value to it, and I would just point out that uh, there's some wonderful marketing slides you can find online that have a decoding of what color means in terms of how you feel about it. John Deere Tractors uses green. Why? <laughs> Agriculture. Whole Foods, green. Why? Health, greenness. Look at all your major insurance companies. Blue Cross, Blue Shield, USAA, Aetna. You see the point. You can find this slide. We opted to not go with slides. Think about what the color, what's the color of most fast food restaurant logos? Red. Energy. Gets you, it gets you excited. There's a beautiful science of color, and it doesn't cost you any seconds. But you need to think about it. And um, a particular book that I'm going to reference at least a couple times today, Edward Tufte wrote a wonderful book. This gentleman, Alberto Cairo, a mastermind from El Mundo who does infographics. I very rarely buy books anymore, but just due to the quality of the print itself, and 90 minutes worth of lecture in the back, he talks about the, the brain aspects of color. And here's one tip for you for color. Pure colors are dangerous. Red, green, bam. Use saturated, or subdued colors because otherwise people don't know where you want them to look. And I'm telling you, from a military environment, everything's red and green and it's all over the place. And use the natural colors of light blues that you see in the sky, your various greens and grays. Grays are very powerful colors because it provides information without calling attention to it. Meanwhile, if you want to have a little fun, and I'm warning you, don't, don't complain when you've wasted a lot of time on this. If you have a pen out, write down co-scheduler, headline analyzer, co-schedule, headline analyzer. It's a free tool. It's a come on because they want you to get into there. It's a, it's a sort of a PR uh, system, but it's a wonderful way. Think about when you're scrolling your phone and you're looking at headlines, and unless it says... Um, ODU is reducing staff by 55%. You're going to scroll right past these things, right? Because they've got to get your attention in less than 11 seconds. I think Congressman Forbes might be being uh, generous with 11 seconds. So how do you write a good headline? There are people who will say you take 50% of your time in the blog space writing your headline, the other 50% writing your article. Because if they don't read your article, it doesn't matter what you wrote. And how do you get attention in this world with so much stuff coming out through that pipe? So go to this headline analyzer and have some fun. And it will grade you, but it won't just grade you. It will help you improve. It will help you. I use it. I used it to title one of my papers for this session. Not this session, but for this conference. And it will show you words and what they mean and how they look on Google, Facebook, etc., etc., etc. And my point to you is, as I said, is you can think about those, those small elements of attention steps when you can't get up in a room but you want to get somebody and shake them and say, listen to me, is you need to be the purple cow. You need to be the meatball Sunday. Think about that one. That's what's on the cover. You need to be different. You need to stand out. You need to make attention. And you can do that through color. Look at me. Or that headline. You, and you know it. You know it when you feel it. You go, oh, I've got to open that one. But you can, you can uh, avail yourself to those kind of magic tricks that the marketing world and HBR, I've asked now three marketers, friends of mine, and they've all just in an informal poll, all have pointed to 
Harvard Business Review as a, a leading source of marketing wisdom, which was a surprise to me personally. Because I didn't think, I mean, they do a lot on that, but I thought clearly there's going to be some journal. Nope, that's the one. That's the one that they really use because it's, it's a, it's a complementary of business and casual readership and the like. So that's what I'd like to share with you about attention. Thank you. I just want to jump in with something um, uh, to um, build on what Jay uh, has been saying. Uh, the real, um, kind of the buzzword in psychology is conspicuity. So a lot of what he was discussing is making things more conspicuous, more noticeable. And it can be visual. Uh, if very often we are discussing visual conspicuity. It could be done through color. But it could be done through a, a number of different ways. So the question is if you need to grab someone's attention, you have to be conspicuous. You can't be inappropriately so, as we uh, just discussed as well, but conspicuity is, is critical if you need to capture someone's attention. So um, since we're talking about attention, I know, um, Melissa, we were talking about some situations uh, that you had capturing the attention of some of the higher-ups and uh, trying to convey information to them. Right. And so for the few of you who weren't here before, um, I'm from the Department of Agriculture. And part of my discussion was about what we learned last year from the bird flu outbreak. So my group does modeling and simulation, and we had results that we needed to present to management. So I should say, first of all, that the management was very stressed by the outbreak. The whole agency goes um, as an emergency response, and so they were under some <coughs> stress. I would also say our group is very small, and most normally, the work that we do is uh, uh, published in a, a normal kind of academic fashion. In journals or presented at conferences, uh, you know, we're not usually uh, sending up the red flare, right? But in this case, we were asked to model and to do that. So what we found is that in the short amount of time that we had to communicate our message, a lot of times we were really bad at doing that. And so what would happen from that is that uh, we would get questions. And so, for example, one of the questions was, well, why did, the not, why did the model not look like the real world? And, and we were perplexed because actually the model performed so well that we were off by one farm in our initial runs. One, one farm. Um, these are things that we've never been able to validate in the real world. So that was incredible. So when we were all scratching our head as to why they were not thinking that we were very accurate. Um, but you know, when we looked at the picture, I remember that I actually asked, is your projector showing the right colors? So what I think happened is that um, in the description of those visualizations that we're showing, we didn't, um, the, the, the management was, had their attention elsewhere and they really didn't get the message that we needed to send. And what that also taught us is that we needed to send the message in a better way maybe using that 11 second rule to get that across. So along the same lines, they, uh, when we did do our, our simulations, we attempted to track the outbreak according to the real path that it was following. Um, and the management, management came back and said, well, why didn't you start it over there? They had chickens over there. And we were like, what? So again, we think that they weren't really paying attention that we were attempting to follow the real path. And um, um, so, you no, know, we didn't model it over there. So it, it was really interesting in um, making sure that when you are with them that you communicate your message that can get it across in that short period of time. So that was our learning on attention. Great. Thank you. So. The next concept is working memory. As I mentioned, working memory is uh, considered to be an elaboration of the concept of short-term memory, and it's pretty much whatever you're actively thinking about, which means the information you're bringing in through attention, but it's also information you might be uh, withdrawing, so to speak, from long-term memory. Uh, so it's kind of the, uh, where the information is uh, brought together and, and uh, potentially synthesized. Uh, some of you have probably, hopefully, been using your working memory uh, sitting in here. Who can remember the titles of the, uh, the books that Jay mentioned at the beginning? The, the books that Jay mentioned at the beginning of the panel. Who can remember the titles of them? Uh, 
Meatball oh. Sunday and Purple Cow. Meatball Sunday and Purple Cow. Yeah, I'm getting those. Are those right? Yes. That sounds right to me. That's what I remember too. So I, I'm unfamiliar with those titles, and I was using my working memory to try to remember them as well. So if you're, you know, rehearsing that information, trying to, you know, keep it up there, so you're going to remember it into the future. You are using your working memory, and you're actually uh, starting to encode that memory for storage into long-term memory. Uh, if you don't rehearse it enough, then you lose it. Uh, you can always write it down, refer to it later, and start to commit the, the information to long-term memory. But for the most part, if you're actively thinking about it, trying to remember it, you're using your working memory. Okay? Um, so, um, Melissa, I think you had another yeah. example uh, from work of situations where working memory has been overloaded. I do. So, in the same situation with the HPAI outbreak, so you know that those managers, they have just been um, stressed to the max. So, uh, and also, when we do um, our, our models, that we look at a baseline scenario, and then we may look at between 12 and 48 different variations on that scenario. So that right there, we have a whole stack. And then we run multiple iterations. So when we, our results come out, we get uh, a distribution of results. So uh, after we had presented our results to one set of managers, they, they went into the next meeting, which luckily our boss was also in that next meeting. And the, the leader, the highest level leader in there stood up and said, the worst case scenario happens 65% of the time. And we were just like, oh my God. God. <laughs> no, the worst case happened once. It was that outlier. It was way out of that probability, it was way out here. So, so like she like had to call a timeout and say, "Oh, hold on, hold on here." Um, we had a range of possibilities, and yes, that one was worse, but it did not happen sixty-five percent of the time. So, the best thing that I can imagine is that poor person was dealing with. He was juggling way too many balls in that meeting to 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 get to that result. So that I just um, that's our favorite joke. Sixty-five percent. Okay. Do you have anything to add? I'm big into the visual space, um, and it, it reminds me of a, of a course I took that discusses that you have different types of glyphs, different ways to communicate information, and you've all seen bad graphics where it comes to, uh, let's say, volume versus area versus the length of a line, and the ability of color really is, is it's got a double-edged sword to it in terms of, I don't know if this fits so much, but to, to follow up on that point is, Color is the thing that will grab your attention the most. It's also the most difficult to discern differences unless you get to the extremes. And if you've ever seen a chloropleth map, which is what you saw there, was, it was one color, but chloropleth, a heat map, you're going to have a lot of difficulty discerning between the middle sections, but it sure does give you a very big overview very quickly, yet the real powerhouse is going to be your comparative lines on a common axis, things you've seen in various chart forms. And in the middle, you have to really be careful of the, the role of area versus volume versus lines. And so you have this stacking effect of your friends are your lines that show scale, but they can also be very difficult to immediately grab onto. And so you need to make a balance point when you are trying to visualize information, balancing your color your saturation and your U, H-U-E, I know I don't say that right because my daughter tells me this, with your precision. And knowing, I, I was just thinking about that when you said it because knowing, um, I, I was taught a long time ago, it's like the 60 minutes test. If we all walked out of here and 60 minutes crew was right out that door, working memory, what do you want them to remember? You need to make sure you're working to shape that in their mind, in their working memory, because if they were to walk out that door, you want them to say what you want them to say. Um, Cairo has a great quote that talks about, and I, I wrote it down, because I, I just thought it was, it was very good. And it says, if you know the tricks and shortcuts that the brain uses, this is a lot about neuroscience in here, but it's really done in a nice way. You can use that knowledge to your advantage. And 
I don't mean that in a, in a sort of a negative tone. It's, that's our job. It's to share very, it was on one of your slides, it's very challenging to share some of this information. It's your job if you're in the world of data and everybody's in data these days. So it's really a, a mandate, universal mandate. Let's go with that. That sounds pretty awesome. Um, that's what I want you to remember as you walk out in 60 Minutes is out there. It's, it's the universal mandate that you should really be thinking about your visuals as much as your verse. So um, working memory, as, as we discussed, does have some pretty serious limitations. Um, there's a classic paper that was published that um, some of you may already know. Uh, George Miller, 1956, uh, oh, discussed yeah. the limits of uh, short-term memory, which is really just the general concept of working memory, as being seven plus or minus two chunks of information. And um, in modern uh, psychology, we, don't, we know that's not entirely accurate. There are a whole list of caveats that go along with that. But it's still a nice convenience uh, factor for remembering that um, short-term memory or working memory in this instance does have some pretty, some pretty serious uh, capacity limitations. So you don't want to overload people with too much information at once. Um, and really, you know, we can dovetail this with the uh, 11 second uh, rule. You have 11 seconds to capture a politician's attention and get them to want to know more. Mm -hmm. Once you have their attention and you need to convey you know, whatever information that you want to convey, you want to make sure your uh, message is pretty straightforward and simple, not, not nuanced. Um, it you know, doesn't have 56 you know, complex parts. Mm -hmm. You really need to, to boil it down. You know, I, I hate the term dumb it down, but you need to <coughs> simplify if you're going to convey it in a very quick and straightforward manner. And you know, especially if you are briefing someone like a politician, they don't need to know all the nuances. They, they need accurate information, or at least accurate enough to make a decision. Um, but there are those attentional limitations on the front end but also they are sub suspect or subject to the same working memory limitations. So just don't give them a flood of information because they just can't retain it all. Um, you know, I, I was always taught uh, when I was um, a graduate student and starting to do some teaching on my own that you know, a good 15 minute lecture essentially has three major points. <laughs> They're not going to retain anything more than that. And I'm not saying we always, subscribe to that. We've you know, been in, in classes where you know, there was this pressure to cover certain information and, and uh, uh, provide that, but uh, just think of the good, you know, the better talks you've been to um, that, that were more inspirational kinds of talks or, or you know, dealing with uh, a data synthesis as opposed to you know, reporting particular studies. There were probably around three major points, take home messages. So there's a reason that's very effective, and it's because it deals, um, it's tailored to uh, the limitations of our working memory. Any other thoughts on working memory? Uh, All right. Yeah. Let's All right, go ahead. And, oh, thank you. Let's go ahead and move on to long-term memory. So long-term memory, again, is that relatively uh, permanent form of memory where you can recall memories from uh, a few days ago to 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, it is imperfect, um, and when you recall information from long-term memory, what you're actually doing is reconstructing it. You're reactivating certain pathways in the brain uh, in order to recall the information. There are actually some theories out there that suggest that everything we ever learned and committed to long-term memory is up there. It's just a matter of recalling it, and that can be done uh, to a, a, a better or lesser degree based on how often you've accessed the information, uh, if, you, if you've used it recently, all these are, are different kinds of factors that can influence recall of long-term memory. So, um, Jay, I, you were talking at the social yesterday yeah. uh, about uh, you know, some particular connections you've made yeah. with long-term memory, so, some just well-ingrained learned associations. You want to talk about those? Yeah, I hope I can remember them. The 9-11. Um, Space Shuttle Challenger, you know where I'm going with this, right? Instant, instant recall, I bet you. I won't ask for a hand, show of hands. <clears throat> but we were talking about, and I do like to read about neuroscience, 
because of its role in data science, artificial neural networks, convolutional ne neural networks. If you watch Netflix, it's happening to you. So I'm interested in this and how they're really modeling the brain. And as I started learning, I, I didn't realize that some of it was chemical and some of it's electrical. And there's all these parts of the brain. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And when we were talking about the long-term memory, my wife had commented recently that she read a blog that she said, I know why you have a good memory. It seems like I can remember things longer. I mean, in about our own existence together. And she says, it's because you talk a lot. And we are in that respect very much different, gender reversed, I call it, where I like to come home and talk about my day, and my wife is very quiet, and she says, uh, she's not a mouse, but she will hold it in. And yet, we will talk about something from 15 years ago or 10 years ago, and it just won't be there. And it's that bringing it back. It's the bringing it back, or sticking it. You know, so what's this? Yeah, some would say it's a museum piece, and <laughs> does the Smithsonian realize that you have this? Come on, bring it, bring it. I actually still use this every week, okay? But you know what it really is? It's my time capsule, because this was my daughter's iPod. She went off to college. Well, I'm going to get a little misty here. She went off to college this year. It was tough for her. It's tough for us. First one out. And uh, it's uh, funny. When she was a sophomore and I was listening to those darn songs that she was playing in the morning, it, it wasn't a bother, but it was like, wow, how many times do I have to listen to that song? And you know now that nothing changes on this anymore. And there's a real strong connection. It all comes back. Right? It all comes back. We were talking about purple cow. And um, something else happened just about a week Prince. ago. Yeah. Uh -huh. Prince. <laughs> uh, Prince, the artist. I'm, I'm a creative. I, I, I was an artist for a little while. Unsuccessfully, obviously. And um, he was my very first concert. Very first concert. And I was talking to a friend of mine who is an author. He's written for the pilot a couple of articles, so he's, he's gotten some things published. And I said, this would, he, he, is a, he was a remarkable true artist. Prince was an artist. And he didn't care what you thought about what he wrote. And he went through so many cycles. You can't pin him down. I said, you need to tell that story. And in the middle of that story, you know, it came all back to my head, and I have a clue, but Chris here should explain it a little bit to me. I can tell you, as I was talking to him, I could draw you a, I could have a, a, a sketch. I know exactly what the scene looked like on the lake in Rhode Island at our cousin's house with the, with the boat out there and their little camper and the plaid shorts of the 70s, the day that someone ran to the campsite and they said Elvis Presley died. My parents were huge Elvis Presley fans. I was too young to really get into it. Think about what just happened there. I can't explain it. So why am I talking about this? Because it's deep. It's emotional. And so my thought when I was talking to Chris is, if you've got to give that pitch to a senior leader, a decision maker, and you happen to know something about them, and I'll caveat this to say, it is not their primary job. Let's say you're going to talk to the admiral about training, and he owns the training command. He's probably pretty in tune with that because that's what he does. But I believe, and this is just a layman's person, is you can reignite connections that will, as Cairo says, will be to your advantage. If you're being asked to go into a place, when I said those two words, 9-11, Space Shuttle Challenger, it, it's a deep feeling. Those music tunes on my daughter's iPod, iPad, I, whatever it's called. We don't even know what they're called anymore. It is so artifact. artifact. And then like that thing that happened to me in real life just a week ago, that's some strong stuff. You can tease that out, I would suggest. And it's a skillful art. I'm not saying I know how to practice it even, but I'm a, I'm a, I respect the idea of sort of long-term memory. And then I think you've got that, that, that connection going. And sometimes when it's coming down to sales or a BD call or, or a pitch or asking for funding or whatever the case may be, it's another tool in your, in your kit. 
So I have just a couple of thoughts. The first is the reason you remember more than your wife in general is probably largely a function of, of talking more. Um, it's called levels of processing theory. Uh, the more ways and the deeper in which you process information, the more likely you are to remember it and commit it to long-term memory. So um, if you hear things, if you speak things, if you write things, if you see things, you're encoding the same general information, conceptual information, in multiple different ways. So you're generating multiple neural pathways associated with that information, and you're more likely to remember it. It's interesting, there's um, one of the tips I've given students throughout the years, uh, which really makes a difference, is um, you know, come, I teach physiological psychology. It's one of the classes I've taught more uh, than anything else. Mm -hmm. And I say, come to class and take notes. Take them by hand, handwritten, with an actual pen. Um, you're listening to the lecture, you're writing down the information, and then either later, you know, the same day, or the very next day, Read over your notes. Make sure they make sense. Uh, tell, almost relive class. Tell yourself a little story around it. And then, if, especially if your handwriting is not great, type up your notes. And what that does is it forces them to process the information multiple different ways. Visual, visually, aurally, uh, kinesthetically. Kinesthesis is uh, the sense of body uh, movement. Uh, so, by processing in multiple different ways and on multiple occasions, they're far more likely to remember the information. It's interesting uh, because there's uh, recent uh, data that's come out um, that suggests that comparing typing versus handwriting for mm -hmm. note taking in lectures and what have you, handwritten is superior for recall. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it gets at this levels of processing. You're processing mm -hmm. the information in different ways. With typing, you are just not encoding the information in the same manner as you do when you have handwritten letters. So make sure you tell your daughter. Uh, she needs to know this. <laughs> um, so levels of processing makes a big difference on, in uh, committing information to long-term memory. Uh, the second point uh, deals with these associations. Uh, so when we were talking last night, um, you know, we ta started to talk about Prince, and you uh, referenced how that brought up, you know, these memories of Elvis. Right. Why would that happen? It's because they're in the same general category, major pop stars or rock stars. Um, and when you start thinking about a concept, um, it's actually easier to start recalling information about related concepts. It's called spreading activation theory. And... Uh, You'll see it in two different contexts. One is the cognitive psychology literature well, where they'll talk about just conceptually. So if you start recalling information about a particular concept, it'll be easier to recall related concepts. But it actually happens at a, a physiological level as well. When you activate particular neural pathways associated with uh, a concept and, or a memory, um, it's actually easier to recall <coughs> Um, information that's related because the um, the electrochemical stimulation associated with recalling the original in information actually spreads out and makes it easier to activate other neurons in the brain, and so you'll start recalling that. So you know, let's just think of um, uh, we, we can pick almost any instance, but think about your your freshman year of college. And uh, you know what it was like, and uh, you know where you lived, and you know some of your your professors and your classes, and so if you start thinking about this, the more you think about it, the more detail you're going to be able to recall. You know, just think of a time when you've reminisced with an old friend, and you remembered some of the things your friend remembered other things, and you fed off each other and increased each other's recall that way. By using these kinds of associations. Um, you can improve long-term memory. And uh, if we are doing a briefing, kind of tying into what Jay was talking about, if you are briefing someone um, and you can help them create an association, they'll remember the information uh, better. So you want to be conspicuous, but not inappropriately so. And you want to uh, help them develop some kind of an association so that they're more likely to remember the information right off the top of their head. And you know it happens sometimes. People will make an impression. You know some people are, and some events are simply unforgettable. 
Um, if you can't be that way, it's, it's good, as long as you do it in a good way. <laughs> There's an old saying I heard, they, this gentleman who was a, pub, uh, a professional motivational speaker, and he came to our school and he said, everybody lights up a room, everybody. The question is, do you light it up on the way in? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Or on the way out, hey, have a good trip back. Think about it, okay? I love that one. It's, oh, that's it's really in my memory. And you know what? Yeah. That's from 1999, and okay. that just came back. Oh, there you go. The story, so it's fun. Yep. It's fun it's stuff. Spreading activation. Yep. Any thoughts on long-term memory? <laughs> Anything specific? No, I didn't have anything specific. Okay, great. All right. So um, we're nearing the end of the panel, and but one of the things I wanted to offer up to you were some uh, more specific recommendations. Um, for working around cognitive limitations of uh, pesky humans. How do we work around this? So, just a few general tips for accounting for our limitations and also some of the heuristics and biases that we just naturally use when it comes to uh, decision making. When it comes to receiving cues, uh, general attention, uh, remember that attention is limited in terms of how many cues or how much information we can take in. We use Miller's magic number, seven plus or minus two uh, chunks of information as a convenience, but realize that if it's complex information, it's going to be less than that. Um, often the information that we process first is most influential. This is called cue primacy. It's a primacy effect. Uh, it works with memory as well. If I, if I read off a list of, I don't know, 20 uh, things for you to pick up at the grocery store on the way home, uh, you would tend to, remember, tend to remember the first things on the list first. They enter a relatively uncluttered uh, mind and you're just able to attend to them better. We also do see uh, a recency effect as well. You tend to um, remember the most recent cues uh, a little bit better. The middle of the list, that's what's lost. So. Uh, the primacy, primacy effect is most dominant. You, uh, people tend to remember the first things presented, the first information coming in the best. They may remember the most recent ones, uh, but the middle, they, they tend to lose. Uh, we already, already discussed cue saliency. Uh, the saliency of, of a cue is critical uh, for capturing attention. Um, we are also subject to... Um, an imbalanced approach to evalu evaluating cues. So when we are receiving information, um, unless we have time to really evaluate it, we tend to treat all information as being equal. Unless you have a specific reason to uh, downplay some information or to put, put more important weight on something, um, we tend to emphasize uh, the importance of unreliable cues. The thing is, if it's a naive new situation, uh, you don't necessarily have enough information uh, to go by. When it comes to um, generating a plan, if you're doing some problem solving and, and evaluating a situation, which is more of a working memory process, um, we have working memory limitations as to how many plans uh, or evaluations we can generate. It's usually between one and four. Uh, so, here again, um, there's only so much information that we can actively consider and, and hold up here. Um, we're also subject to the availability heuristic. Um, information that we have used recently is easier to recall. And, and because of this, it might be overly influential. Uh, we also are subject to what's called the representativeness heuristic. If we are considering a situation and we're drawing parallels, then that parallel situation from the past uh, that resembles whatever situation you're dealing with now will influence your thinking. We'll say, oh, okay, oh, well, this is like when we had you know, the bird flu outbreak of 1999. Um, I'm making this up on the fly, but still, that's the general idea. You might actually draw false parallels. It could be helpful, it could be, uh, um, uh, it's your detriment. It, it really just depends on the situation. But it's a shortcut we take. It makes sense to draw parallels. Just realize it could be a false parallel. We also tend to be overly confident in the first 
uh, plan or a first assessment we make. And really, you know, we should keep going. We should keep generating ideas. We should keep generating uh, uh, plans. Uh, but very often we get stuck uh, on the first one. The first pretty good solution uh, to a problem. Uh, our, uh, our first uh, uh, assessment that we make that, that helps us arrive to a decision, <coughs> we, we might just focus on way too much. So uh, this is also comes in the form of cognitive tunneling. Sometimes it's not a matter of just overly emphasizing the first plan. Sometimes you really only come up with one and you get stuck on that and, and you need to keep going. We also tend to experience a confirmation bias. It's something we all have to uh, work against. Uh, but we tend to uh, put too much stock in information that supports our initial assessment, and we downplay information that would be disconfirming. We shouldn't necessarily do so. Um, that disconfirming information actually could be very legitimate and very valuable, uh, but just it's one of the natural tendencies we tend to have. We tend to look for information that confirms what we think. And, you know, I always think of, um, um, I don't even know if it's on the air anymore, but uh, the Ghost Hunters used to be on uh, the Discovery Channel. And uh, every anomalous noise and, and uh, it seemed like everything, for some of them, uh, was in support of there being an invisible spirit in the house. Um, and just, oh yeah, it's got to be this. Or you see the same thing on Finding Bigfoot. Same kind of thing. Every you know, bullfrog noise says, no, that's a Sasquatch. There's a Sasquatch in these woods. That's confirmation bias. You know, certain people are looking for information that supports you know, what they believe or what they think. Um, but really, we should seek out this confirming information to avoid these kinds of biases. The last part deals with long-term memory. Um, when we are trying to come up with a plan uh, and make a decision, um, we have to realize long-term memory stores a lot of information. It's thought to be nearly infinite. I doubt it really is, but it's big enough for a lifetime plus. But our ability to recall that information appears to be limited. And working memory itself is limited. So picture it this way. Uh, if if we, we draw a computer analog, um, uh, the information can be stored on your hard drive, which would be your long-term memory, uh, but you can only put so much of the information, so much of the data in RAM. You know, RAM is your working memory. It's what you're actively thinking about. Uh, so you can have gobs of data you know, uh, uh, on your hard drives, but you can only think about so much at once. Um, we also experience the availability heuristic when it comes to coming up with these plans uh, from long-term memory. Uh, so that's, that's another uh, way that it can influence our decision-making. And the last one is uh, another one of these biases that can influence our decisions. This is powerful information. Framing bias. And you may have heard of this. Your kids might use it on you. You might use it on your kids. Uh, you might use it on your boss or your employees. How you frame a situation can influence the decisions people make. And actually, the example I have you know, works in perfectly with, with uh, um, your role. Um, when it comes to buying uh, ground beef, uh, do you want to buy ground beef that's 90% lean or 10% fat? Okay, now, we can do simple math. We know it's the same thing. But, when they've done studies of consumer behavior, people would rather buy meat that's 90% lean. All we did was frame the question in a different manner, but the actual content, the actual information, was identical. So, um, you know, I've admittedly used this uh, to my advantage several times. Uh, you know, I've provided entirely accurate information um, to people, to decision makers, uh, but I'll ask it a very certain way for a certain reason, because I know that the way I frame a question is going to affect everything. I mean, I, I'm sure you all can think of instances. Any of you, anything come to the top of your heads? 
of situations where you've used the framing bias. You've, you've asked a question a very certain way to get your way. Did you want to share? In board games. In what? In games. Oh, playing board games? Okay. So sometimes I say exactly what I want not to do or what to do so others will follow it. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> you try to psych them out. Yeah. Okay. Can anyone else think of something? You know what? I'm just thinking of situations where, um, you, know, you know, maybe I wanted to purchase something uh, um, through work and um, it involved a budgetary request. You gotta sell it a certain way. And the way you frame the question makes all the difference in the world. You play up the pros, you downplay the cons, uh, but but I still try to provide accurate information. Either, either of you think of any instances? I, one that I've always found interesting is, and I don't know if this is in the same realm, but the idea of anchoring when it comes to n numbers. I don't know if that's in a different dimension, but the first number on the table, it has a, there was some studies done by a Dan Arely, or a Ariel, A-R-I-E-L-Y, and he did a lot of social, I don't know if it was social psychology or not, but when eBay was really coming out, you know, it was like, it was a new thing, he was writing Predictably Irrational, it's one of my favorite books, it's a, it's a book of vignettes, and he did a lot of social studies, uh, fun ones, easy yeah. ones, when he was teaching in uh, Harvard, I think, before he went to Chapel Hill. And the power of anchoring auction prices, fake auction prices, yes. anchoring the idea of he put a drop of balsamic vinegar in a beer at a Harvard uh, bar, and he, he, he spun it as something better. I think, I don't know if it was him or someone else, that when people were finding those, like, I don't know if they're called chocolate pearls or chocolate diamonds, mm -hmm. but they put it on Madison Avenue in an exclusive, and you can't, they're junk, right? No, they're not junk, they're, they're chocolate diamonds, and that's, <laughs> so it's this whole, and they, and they, you know, these are the kind of phenomena that I, I found fascinating as a consumer mm -hmm. to be aware of, and like we say, I think maybe an underlying theme of this is that about advantage. Um, we heard it yesterday, if I can make a connection to yesterday's talk in the plenary, we know that these chat bots are online servicing the people who are servicing us. And if you weren't in this plenary, it's artificial intelligence is prompting service providers, you call in with a problem, and we were told yesterday during Richard Boyd's session that they have that, and his sort of, sort of call to arms is, when do we get our own personal chat bot? to combat that because you're at a disadvantage. There's that word again. So when you're on the showroom floor, uh, did anybody hear it? One of the fascinating ones, I know, I, I know people who have made a living, well, not a living, made a, a, a minor league career of extending their serious radio coverage indefinitely. Because they know when to call and what to say in that six-month package now they've had it for over three years. It's infinitely scalable. It costs them nothing to deliver it, right? And they weigh things out. He says now they'll actually, if you weren't there, um, they're actually, I think, he didn't say this, but my theory is when they say this, this call may be recorded for quality and training purposes, it's also because he said, please help me, help me not go askew here. This is live. This is like uh, unplugged. Eric Clapton unplugged. <laughs> They're listening to the tonality of the voice so that when you say, I really don't think I want that subscription anymore, or hey, look, just stop it, the prompt is give him one more month, give him six more months. And so his sort of vision is your personal chatbot, so when it's all listening and you hear the fervor and the guy in the plaid suit going crazy, it's like, what do I offer? Offer him 32. You know, and it just, for me, that plays a, a number of scenarios out there as to what does that mean 10 years from now. I clearly needed these tips a while ago because my <laughs> six-month serious subscription ran out, <laughs> and, and, and I said no, and they left it at that. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. I, I just have to, you know, put my MP3s and stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And so do any of you out there in the audience have any particular questions for the panel, uh, either individuals or us as a group? Anything related to human cognition and some, some of our limitations? Yes. So just one comment. Uh, the, the image that you conjured in my mind, uh, I didn't hear the talk, but now I'm imagining this, this PDA sort of chat bot, spy versus spy kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> you got an army of right. bots on either side interacting with each other to try to get the best deal. Yeah. Um, so I think that's interesting. Uh, the, the question I have is, is kind of, um, it's about stories and the role of storytelling and getting people to remember. Um, you know, so it's there's, for you. Yeah. <laughs> there's um, you know, there's kind of a, you lose something, I think, in the story sometimes. It becomes this abstraction that isn't quite the reality, but then it becomes memorable. And so you gain something through that trade-off at the same time. Um, you know, and, and I also think that you can potentially run into trouble when people hear a story and they're thinking about their own past and story, and then there's, I don't know what you call the kind of bias when they're trying to overlay their past experience and, oh, this sounds just like this other thing that I did. So you kind of run that risk too. Um, but I think I found it at least you know, indispensable in thinking about what story it is that I'm trying to tell with my data, or at least thinking through how the audience is going to perceive it through their story making kind of point. Doing something real quick uh, here. Memory is malleable and definitely imperfect. And when you remember events, you're essentially reconstructing the events. Uh, it's not like we have like a DVR in our head and we hit play. You're reconstructing the events and trying to get you know the, the timing of everything right, the sequence of the events right, what things looked like, all these kinds of things. And so it's all representational. It's it's a very non-literal way of storing information up here. And um, because of that, it, it definitely is subject to um, changes over time. And um, I mean, sometimes it's very innocent. Sometimes it is altering things in a minor way so that it fits the script, so that it fits, a, uh, it tells a better story than is accurate. <laughs> sometimes it's an incomplete story and we fill in gaps. Um, sometimes they're reasonable guesses, sometimes they're not. Um, uh, you know, some people engage in what's called confabulation, which is essentially making up a story to try to make sense of things. So um, there's been a lot of literature looking at uh, eyewitness memory um, and how accurate it can be. And you know, basically what all the, the scientific literature says is that eyewitness memory can be very, very poor um, because of these, uh, these memory kinds of errors. There's... Um, uh, well-known memory researcher, uh, Daniel Schachter, who writes about the seven sins of memory. And that's a lot of what he's getting at, are, are these just kind of innocent memory errors that affect us all the time. Uh, and storytelling can play into this uh, because you know, a lot of times we're trying to tell a better story. Not purposefully, not for manipulation, it's just we try to make sense of things. And one of the ways is through stories. Yeah. Chime in. When you were talking about long-term memory, a thought I had as you were saying that is when you consider that there are very, in many cases, no original manuscripts of some of the early classics, history, I think paradoxically, has story in it. And all the early history that is known of a person's past is through storytelling. So I was thinking about the long-term memory, where you think about it, it's not just for you to remember, it's how did generations that there was no written art form, mm -hmm. how did the stories continue over the centuries and eons? But when it comes to story, and I did a paper, and we, Candace uh, and I wrote one on big data and telling the visual story. And I asked people if they'd ever been to a no kidding, there's a lot of storytelling executive events you can go to now. It's gotten very, um, it's kind of passing, not passing, but it, the, it's, yeah, it, it was big, boomy, and now it's, it's kind of, I would say, commonplace if you're looking for it. If you've never heard about it, it's new to you, right? It happens to me. The key word's engagement, and then how much. That's, this is my theory on it. So if you want rapt attention, you can do that strongly through, I call it the verse and the visual. And what you choose to lay out there in the story 
you can make it. I subscribe to two theater companies in the area. That's my support of the arts. I believe it's art is important to all society. And I say pick a form and support it, right? I choose the theater. I choose that because I don't know anything about sports so well, but it's the same dynamic. We were joking about this. Is can you imagine? Okay, Lady Monarchs, our, our local, you know, very good women's basketball team, show me what you got. What kind of a performance do you think is going to happen? It's a two-way. Ever since the days of the gladiators, it was, yeah, bam, more, boom. It's this energy. It's about energy. So I go to theater. Now, I choose theater that I call, I work for it. I like to work for my theater. But what's the other kind of theater that's very common? Dinner theater. And that's like watching a favorite movie again. It's there for the entertainment value. Think about the levels of engagement just in this simple example, and maybe it's not a very good one. Theater that's a classic will make you work for it. It's very emotional, <coughs> not in a tear-jerking way. It's just, it's got you. It's, it's, it's visceral. It's pulling everything out. I don't have a lot of time to think about anything else because I'm immersed. And I say, yes, there's visual, there's immersion, and we're talking about VR and augmented reality. And I was once talking to a gentleman who does, uh, did physics with NATO, and I always talked that there's different levels of immersive environments, and there's a very powerful one called the inside of your skull. Your imagination can take you away, and you, you're gone. That's Chick sent me high's flow theory. You're gone, man. You're just not there. But now if you don't want that in the storytelling, you can allow for the inquisitive question, what would you do? Because if you want to engage an audience, at least in, a, in an intellectual way, you ask the rhetorical question and everybody's answering it, but you don't want the blah, 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 because you don't have time for it. But you've engaged them, but now you've put them on a track and you're moving them. So it really, for me, it's all about choosing the <coughs> level of engagement, whether I want them sucked into something, and this is, all again, all for good, right? You were a storyteller. Or do you want them to play with the space? Or are you doing a brainstorming session in which storytelling can allow you to walk through some very classic models like The Hero's Journey. If you've never heard of it, I highly, highly recommend it. Joseph Campbell, Hero's Journey. It's a great framework. There's many renditions of it from 8 to 18 steps. <coughs> and, um, and then there's another just classic, and it's in the paper we put. It's somebody else's storytelling method. Build a character. You need, to, you need to make it something relatable. What's the problem? What's the tension? This is the stuff we learn in fifth, uh, eighth grade, ninth grade English. And then finally, where is the future going? And that's where you shape the story. Storytelling is, so, is just super critical in our yeah. field yeah. in general. Um, this is one of my favorite stories. <coughs> I'm all choked up about it, though. Um, so... <coughs> I do some uh, collaboration with the DOD and have some, some funding. And I'll be kind of vague because of the nature of the story, but any of you who you know, work with the government, uh, you know you have to get your publications routed uh, through you know, the command or the chain of command or management or whoever to get approval uh, for public dissemination or for publication in the case of papers. <coughs> so um, we were routing one of my papers through uh, the command and I got a comment back from uh, the highest level uh, of the, the chain that said, uh, it, this was a typical science paper. You know, I was presenting data. Uh, so that, just so you know what kind of paper it was. The comment was, I think you're guilty of, t quote, telling a story rather than reporting science, but it's a style thing, so it's okay. <laughs> and it just set me off. And so I, I typed up this thing to, to one of my collaborators, uh, one of the co-authors on the paper. Certainly didn't send it to the higher up, uh, but uh, it just said, um, that is the entire purpose, is telling a story. And uh, you know, heaven forbid I write a paper that somebody might actually want to read. <laughs> and you'll be able to make it from beginning to end without lethal doses of no-dose. <laughs> so um, my response apparently became infamous around there. They actually printed it out without my information on it. So it was scrubbed of my identity. They posted it in one of their, uh, on a bulletin board in one of their meeting rooms so everyone could see it. Uh, but it was true. I mean, I was taught that good scientific writing 
involves telling a story. And uh, that's what I've always taught my PhD students and, and, and our, our master's students. Uh, and that's what I've always you know, tried to do. And it's because, as humans, we are wired to respond to storytelling. Uh, so, I mean, all of us have read you know, papers that tell good stories, and we've also read papers that were just horrible to get through. Because all they did was report science, but there yeah, was no yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. You get to the end, it's like, okay, what's the story? Yeah. Um, we, we need stories. Yeah. yeah. We have that exact problem with our modeling results because we get just um, volumes of results. We have one model in one format that returns 2,000 variables as a result. And it's like nobody can even work with 2,000. <laughs> you don't even have software to work with 2,000 variables. Um, unless you're running an Oracle, right? You know, and um, so how, how, you know, the, the analysts would like have to pick out their two columns and take those. And it was like, well, you missed everything else that could have taught, could have been a part of that story. So I have a comment and then a yes. question. So my comment is, um, here is my active memory not working, but um, the, the statement you made about the congressional member mm -hmm. saying 11 seconds, well, I totally identified from all my years in government where it's the option of, um, we call it the elevator speech. Okay. Uh -huh. So it's more of you do that first and then you say, now do you want to hear the story? So basically the elevator speech being going in with your catchy line of what's your punchline first. You might have to leave with the result depending on what the driver is of the administration and then why it is an issue and then who's affected, and the, for the executive that you're speaking to, why should they care and who else cares? And mm. then you say, now do you want to hear this story? Because we think this is an impactful issue. Mm. And so we, that has been my strategy, because I don't eliminate the story, and I do agree, you know, all the way, all the time, just showing data yeah. doesn't do anything for people, but when I walk into meetings with ex my exec my leadership, sometimes they're like, Latifa, we don't want your dissertation today. We want to just know what should we be caring about most. And so, that, so that's just my comment. So I entirely agree with the 11 second rule, <laughs> because that is something with fast pace in what you're doing in policy making and government. Unfortunately, I dealt with the types of policy makers that don't dig too much in the weeds until they actually have to. Oh. And so they don't really, it not necessarily, I'm not going to say they don't care, but it's not on the forefront of their brain to care until we tell them why they should care mm. if it impacts them and others who may care and may come after them. Mm. So that's that. I totally agree with that. The second thing, um, it was just so intriguing with what you spoke about, about the levels of the memory. Mm -hmm. And I wonder because. A lot of what you said definitely applies to generations post-college and now in career, yeah. where you tell me, I, I know you know this, I was right. taking meticulous yeah. notes the whole time, but that's how I've been trained. I take my notes, I go home, and I type them up, and as I'm typing them up, my brain is compartmentalizing them and putting them into like ways that will logically flow, but at home with my kids, they feel I feel like they think I'm a dinosaur, mm -hmm. because in their... Um, school systems, it's even eliminating like the, the art of note taking, handwritten note taking, and it's like, oh, every student in the school system gets a computer now, and all the teachers are expecting them to now bring their computers to school and type all their notes when I'm telling the kids, write your notes in your notebook first and then type it up at home, and they're like, yeah. mom, nobody does that. But then I totally see... But there are see... good reasons to do that, and yeah. it doesn't matter if they didn't learn to do that originally. Right, okay. Um, it, it's, uh, if I recall the study and, and the, its results, um, I don't think there were any cohort effects. I don't think it mattered. Mm -hmm. I think it worked for everyone. The, which part works uh, The handwriting. Handwriting exactly. was superior for I recall. I totally agree No matter with that. what. So I'm wondering, like, how much of this concept yeah. of what you spoke about is, to, is actually being... Um, reinforced in the school systems where they, where most school systems are going to don't write anything, just type it out and, yeah. you know. It really depends on the school system. Yeah, I mean, many of them have eliminated uh, um, the cursive writing, hand yeah, writing and cursive writing. And I've seen it as a college professor. I've mm -hmm. seen um, 
you know, students who, I, I've had some who didn't know how to write in cursive. They were right. just fear, you know, trying to print as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a shame. There's Me actually, too. there are a couple good books. I can't give you specific titles, it's, mm -hmm. because actually I need to track them down. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've um, been told, I have a friend of mine who's an MD, PhD uh, uh, with the Army and a uh, good background in neuroscience. And he's told me about a couple of books talking about the neurobiology of handwriting and all the benefits. There are yeah. enormous benefits right. to learning to write uh, well, you know, mm -hmm. basic penmanship, mm -hmm. um, not just in terms of you know, training motor pathways, but also it helps you organize your thinking in particular ways. It aids with recall. There are 101 benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know, I'm sold on it. And, and it's, in fact, it's, it's funny, my, I have young kids. I have a seven-year-old and an almost five-year-old. He's about to turn five. And my girl is seven. And um, uh, she's uh, already trying to write in cursive. She can't wait. She, really, she's trying to run before she can walk. But she's trying to write in cursive. She loves my fountain pens. I got into fountain pens. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm trying to teach her you know, proper penmanship. And um, I think eventually it'll make a difference. And I just hope the schools aren't fighting me on it because they view it as archaic also because I have the evidence behind me. Yeah. Agree. So. I totally agree. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, with that, any last uh, comments from the panel? Uh, because I think we're pretty much out of time. Yeah. I do have one statement I like to make when it comes to the whole idea of visualizing data. That first, we've all really been exposed to art in one shape, way, or form from little kids and drawing ourselves. So really, there's a natural artist in you. And I, I make the challenge that there was, and I don't know the time, Aaron, I tried to get with a colleague today to get the year, and I don't, but there was a basketball star who shunned, pushed back on the idea that I'm not a role model. And this was years ago. Charles Barkley. Thank you. Charles I, I, I remember the story, but I couldn't remember the details. Yeah, I'm not a role model, man. And what I remember my own feelings about it was it comes with the profession. You don't get that choice. If you want to walk into that realm, if you want to be the president of the United States, it comes with other things. If you want to be a movie star, etc., you know what I mean. I would argue the same is applied if you're in the data world. You can't not, I like double negatives, you can't <laughs> not appreciate the psychological impact you're having on decision makers, whether they voice it like the worst case is or not. And I like to say there's three strata. If you are the senior leader, don't let people bring you bad visualization. Just ask them to refine it. If you're the doer, you're, you're stuck with Excel perhaps, but you can change the default color scheme because you, you know that it, it just came out. I don't know why it is. The package I use uses a particular color scheme. Color one is this, two, three, four, five. But I can change that. So don't allow yourself to do bad visualization. Be a little thoughtful about it. And then if you're a manager, like I said, God help you. Because we've got some incredibly, I, I mentor graduate students, I don't even know why. Uh, they could call me, I, I love it, it's an honor. I don't mean it that way. It's, and, and we've got incredible data talent coming out of the graduate schools, and it really, the big bow wave is 2016 because of the nature of the business. Boy. I just don't know what their business understanding is. And then when they start wanting to put all that stuff out there, someone's got to be a good coach. And I don't know, you wouldn't want me as a little league coach because I've never done it that well. So how can you be a coach if you've never played the game? And so it's really a, a challenge to you all to think about, you know, this is, a, again, wonderful book. I very rarely buy a book anymore. But... It is, I think, truly worthy in this data-centric world that we live in to be aware of the artistic aspect of data. What was that title again? It's called The Functional Art, and it's by Alberto Cairo, as in Cairo, Egypt. He's got blogs. It's certainly available. I don't make any money on that. I'm just, I, I was, I found it through one of these, you've got to get this book. You've got to get this book. You got, I'm a tef, tufty guy, and the nice Balancing act is, if you're familiar with Edward Tufte, he's a minimalist. He actually does ink ratio to data, and it's a way, and it's beautiful. He is more of a retrospective look at the history of the use of art in trying to portray information. 
he's, he's a very contemporary, in the now, happening today, and it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful piece of work. There's a free chapter available online. That's, that's why I got hooked on it. I said, I, it's, it's worth it. It's worth the money. You can get it in, in uh, e-format, like yeah. uh, but it doesn't come with the free uh, lecture on it. So I just say it's certainly not the only, but I think there's, a, there's a, certainly a place for appreciation of it. And then find those people and, and motivate those people who turn out to be the savants, if you will, that there is a gift. You know, everybody's got their gifts. Find the person who's your visualization expert and let them run with it. Let them be, please, let them be creative. Please. And then just see where it goes. And it, it's, a, it's a work in art. It's, you know, it's a working art. Yeah. Any final remarks? Yeah, Tufty also lectures, like, you know, we'll do a one-day kind of seminar and go yeah. see him if you ever get the chance. It's yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, he's, he's phenomenal. All right, well, with that, I'd like to thank you all for staying for the panel. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> if we can figure out how. The general location. <laughs> they might appreciate that. They do.